curious, how, how many of you are creatures of habit? You know, you got like your little rituals, your routines. Oh my goodness, I am so pitiful with that. So it doesn't take a whole lot to throw me off. It really does not. So we're in a series called uh, I Just Want to Be Happy. And each week I say that normally when people say that, they say it as though it's a statement of modesty. It's like, look, I don't expect everything. I don't want everything. All I want is just to be happy. And it's a valid desire that we have. Uh, one of the things I've said again in most messages to start with each week is that I think unfortunately churches have given people the opinion that God is some kind of a being that is weird and detached and he's got these certain things he wants us to believe and these certain things he wants us to do but he doesn't really care or understand us he doesn't exactly care about our happiness all he cares about our holiness Randy not our happiness well, well what if holiness is actually his pathway to our highest happiness well he cares about our character more than our comfort yeah I, I agree with that too but what if our Christ-like character development is actually foundational and crucial to the elevation of our happiness so anyway churches have kind of given an impression that God doesn't care about your happiness I want to just state right off your father understands you loves you never been a second that he has not been with you for you but he is limited in what he can do for you and I until we are willing to trust him acknowledge him give him the place of supremacy in our lives that he deserves you say Randy why does he deserve supremacy because he is not only the most important intelligent person in the universe he's the best just think of the nicest person you've ever met they don't compare to God God is not only all powerful he is all good he's the very best he's the safest person in the universe and you and I should always feel free to run toward him not away from him regardless of what our condition is all right each week I've also started with some bad news about happiness the bad news none of us are as happy as we would like to be we just need to acknowledge that if you think about it for a minute you might say well Randy I'm kind of content I'm okay but you could be happier if there was no such thing as danger disease and death how many here would acknowledge I would be happier if there was no danger disease death can I just see your hands okay so we could all be happier by the way the miracles of Jesus for the first time in human history someone came on the planet that demonstrated danger disease and death could actually be eliminated so we're not as happy as we would like to be but the good news is this all of us can be happier than we are I don't care how happy you are you can be happier and that's what this series is devoted to our God loves us he really wants his children to be happy and we can't be as happy as we would like to be that awaits the time when the kingdom of God comes in all of its fullness when God is back present with us face to face where there is no more danger there is no more disease there is no more death but we can be happier right now regardless of our circumstance you say Randy but you don't understand what's going on in my life well I probably do I've probably been through it or at least a lot of us have we all know life has its ups and downs it has things that occur that we would never want to occur but even in those times in life when circumstantially things are not ideal and maybe they're not ideal for an indefinite period of time you and I by God's grace and help can still be happier and that means a lot just a little bit more happiness in the midst of some of these struggles and then the best news is what I've mentioned already all of us can still be perfectly happy God promises that he created us to be happy he loves us every parent that's good wants their children to be as happy as possible the big difference between God and us is this he actually knows what will make our happiness and he guides us to the degree that we will allow it toward that end we try things we're experimenters we, we just seize whatever we think might make us happy for a moment might give us pleasure for the moment God says no no no, no. there's things you don't understand about those kind of impulsive decisions trust me let me guide you let me guard you and you will discover the level of happiness that you're searching for but this is promise ultimately he will bring eternal perfect 
happiness you will never see another sad moment another sad experience in your life when God's kingdom comes in its fullest we'll realize that what we have actually been looking for scratching for getting imperfect pieces of any way that we can it was actually always there in God in his his rule his will his ways all right to kind of get us focused toward today's message I'm going to ask you a question and it's this which of these kinds of people are happier? This is an opinion. Uh, do you think that people that are compassionate, kind, humble, gentle, patient, forbearing, and forgiving are happier? Or do you think that people that are uncaring as opposed to compassionate, that are mean as opposed to kind, that are arrogant, that are harsh, that are impatient, that are intolerant, that are unforgiving? Which one? Do you, column one, happier people, or column two, happier people? Let me see column one hands. Yeah, we all know this. Why? You ever think of that? Well, why is it that my happiness is actually contingent, not upon me getting what I want all the time, but my happiness is contingent upon the kind of a person that I am and that I'm becoming? And, and, and why is it that these things work, make me happier when I'm compassionate, kind, humble, gentle, patient, forbearing, forgiving, and these don't work? What, where, where does this this image of traits come from well we know the answer the scripture says in Genesis 126 that God made us in his own image this is the way God is he is loving he is kind he is good he is compassionate he is gentle he's forbearing he's forgiving and anytime we knowingly or unknowingly uh, stumble into those kinds of mental states or or those kinds of behavior patterns we're living according to the laws of our being that are already built inside of us therefore the more that we develop these traits the more that we cultivate these traits we will be happier it's just reality now I guess what we're saying then about the people on this side is kind of this I'm not sure which of your cars that was but now I mind you I did not say the word <laughs> you laughed I just put it on the screen <laughs> but it's true it's true we, we are our own worst enemy when we live knowingly or unknowingly contrary to the laws of our being we are meant to be beings like God to live like he lives to love like he loves and as we do that we become happier regardless of what our circumstances are all right, today we, we, we want to talk about some things that God has put within our hands that we can cooperate with him and elevate the happiness quotient in our lives. By the way, this message also has something for some of you that have been followers for Christ for a long time, and maybe you're at that portion of um, experience where, where you kind of feel stuck, you're a little bit frustrated, you're not growing as fast as you want, you, you're wishing so much that some parts of your life were, were already taking on a more Christ-like look, but you're just kind of stuck, and, and you're kind of doing all the stuff that you think you're supposed to do, but you can't figure it out. Why am I not growing more? Why am I not experiencing more Christ-like transform, transformation? Second part of this message will have very special help if you're in that condition. All right. What we want to look at is this, things I must cultivate. There are certain things that will contribute to my happiness, your happiness, that won't happen unless I intentionally, you intentionally cultivate certain character traits. We looked at that list a minute ago and we saw that, you know, the people that, that practice these things, they are happier. The people that don't are unhappier. We're going to look at a portion of Scripture written by, once again, the Apostle Paul, the greatest servant of God. Uh, the Spirit of God used him to write 13 books in the New Testament. He served, served Christ for about 32 years, was finally martyred by Nero at the end of his journey. And when he writes this letter, he is in one of his imprisonments. He was in prison a lot, and he is writing from a jail cell shackled to a Roman guard. And here's what he says. In the book of Colossians, he planted a church in the city of Colossae, and then he writes this letter to coach them later on we have it now in our new testament he says therefore as god's chosen people holy and dearly loved we have to ask ourselves who are these people he says they're they're chosen people they're holy and they're dearly loved he is writing to those who have made a decision and you need to you need to really lean forward and listen to this part if you're not real familiar with what puts one in a relationship with god and what 
stands for one not being in a real relationship with God. He is writing to people that have made a decision that in a world where everybody is following somebody, usually it's ourself that we're following. We're just kind of winging it. We're just kind of doing things our way. We're just kind of making it up as we go and seeing what works, what doesn't. He's saying he's writing to people that they suddenly saw something about the way God was in a person called Jesus of Nazareth. And they believed God was in Jesus. And so they were so impressed with the life and the miracles and the love and the sacrificial death and the resurrection from the grave of this person called Jesus that they said, man, in a world where everybody's following somebody, I'm putting my trust, my faith, my trust in this one Jesus. And he's won my confidence. He's won my trust. I'm going to follow him fully for the rest of my life. I'm going to follow him freely because he's won me over and I'm going to follow him forever. That is what it means to have a relationship with God in which he can continue to guide us, guard us, mold us, shape us, help us develop to be who he always meant us to be and do what he always meant us to do and in that process make us happier. That is what it means to be a Christian. That is what it means to be certain, God says, that our sins are forgiven and that we have the free gift of eternal life. Jesus said in John 10, 27, he said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them, free gift, I give them eternal life, and they'll never perish. So Paul, the apostle, is writing to individuals that were Christians, ones that wanted to be like Christ. That's what Christian means. Christian doesn't mean one that wants to go to heaven. Christian means one that wants to be like Christ, one that likes Christ, Christ first of all and likes Christ so much that they want to be like Christ you got to ask yourself did I just describe you there there are a lot of people in church world that (laughs) that that very much want to go to heaven I mean I just don't know of anybody that doesn't want to go to heaven and doesn't I don't want to bring up gloom and doom but doesn't want to go to hell real place a real destiny for some nobody wants to go to hell everybody wants to go to heaven but but what if god is not so fixated on keeping people out of hell which is what some churches seem to give the impression of but what if god's real goal is to get the hell out of us what if that's the problem what, what if the problem is the hell in us that's the, the creator of so much of our own unhappiness? You've lived long enough. I've certainly lived long enough to know I can be my own worst enemy. I can be my own greatest happiness spoiler. And, and so God, in this process, because he loves us and wants what's best and know what's best, he wants to draw us into this trusting relationship so now he can lead us, now he can guide us, now he can guard us, now he can shape us, now he can lead us on the path of righteousness which is the path of happiness ultimately so he's writing to those that have put their trust in christ and are his followers and i hope i just included every one of you in this room but you know what you can make that decision before you leave here today it's not an unusual thing for people to come to services like this on a weekly basis they say you know what i've been kind of thinking about things before but i've never really put my trust in Christ and said I'm going to follow him fully and freely and forever he's won my trust and so perhaps this will be the very day that you'll do that all right therefore as God's chosen people holy and dearly loved clothe yourselves we all know that 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 takes action put on clothe yourselves with what well we read that list a minute ago compassion kindness humility gentleness and patience bear with each other and forgive another if any of you has a grievance against someone forgive how much as the what does it say as the lord forgave that's pretty comprehensive we're to forgive one another the way the lord forgives us that's pretty comprehensive let the word of christ that's the bible now for us the bible let the word of christ do what dwell in you richly how how does that happen like if you take a bible and hold it to your face if you sleep on put it under your pillow well that no no we we all know the only way the word of god can dwell in me dwell in you richly is if i am willing to take the capacities that god's given me to focus on the bible to read the bible to study the bible until its principles its ideas its concepts are internalized they're familiar my mind has been reshaped 
renewed by them. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing. I'm to be so saturated, so familiar with the, the truth of God that I can now teach somebody else. I can admonish. That means to you know, confront somebody gently, lovingly, to correct them, to teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. So here's what this passage is urging, urging us to put on these various traits that we saw, put on, cultivate, and then the, the final one, of course, is, is saturate ourselves with the Word of God, which is something this church has been encouraging for 32 years. We are constantly pleading with you, study the Word of God for yourself. Buy us a good study Bible. We, we'll show you an example of one in the store. You can buy in the store if you want a life application study Bible, something that as you're reading the Bible, it will coach you and make it easier for you to understand quickly. So we want to turn now to, to the key components of this message. Here we go. The cruciality of divinely inspired, inspired desires. Desires, the right kind of desires, are very, very powerful. If you and I were to examine a lot of our life, we would realize that a lot of our life have been desire-driven. Unfortunately, some of our desires have driven us into some unfortunate decisions that have done damage to us and damage of others. But divinely inspired desires are really powerful and beautiful and, and, and need to be kind of uh, kindled you know we, we kind of want to continue to stoke the flames as it were to keep those desires alive in us so listen to what Jesus said about divinely inspired desires he said blessed are those who hunger and thirst but they hunger and thirst for what righteousness for they will be filled well, well these are divinely inspired desires Jesus is saying you know the people that are really blessed the people that are really in a good condition before God are people that realize I am not righteous or at least not as righteous as I want to be I'm not as righteous as I need to be I'm not as righteous as my creator is but I want to be I, I see the beauty of it. I see the value of it. I think to myself, what if everybody in the world was righteous, meaning we just do the right things all the time? What kind of a world would it be? Jesus says, if you're in a condition where you know your deficiency of righteousness, but you want to be different, you want to change, you want to be one that does what is right in the sight of God and the sight of man all the time, Jesus says, that, that's a great place to be in. It is important to examine ourselves and see has the familiarity with the truth about God and the truth about life as it centers in Christ has it stirred in you has it stirred in me a desire I want to be like Jesus I want to be righteous I, I've seen something so intoxicatingly beautiful if everybody just lived like he lived and loved like he loved I know the world would be beautiful and I want that for myself I, I don't just like Jesus I desperately want to be like him do you have, has God stirred those kind of desires in you? Hunger and thirst, those are powerful. When you're really hungry and really thirsty, that's intense, intense motivation. So Jesus is saying the person that's in a really good position in life is the person that has desires, divinely inspired desires for righteousness, to live like God lives and love like he loves. Proverbs 11 just kind of adds to this. It says that the desire of the righteous ends only in good. Some of my desires that were not divinely inspired, they did not end in good. We all have our stories, <laughs> we could tell. But when our desires have been divinely inspired, they're the result of things we have read in the word of God, truths we have heard. Well, well, they always end in the right place, and that elevates our happiness. Listen, listen I'm, I'm, a, I'm not trying to be mean-spirited here. I've been, I've been down this road, too. But some of us have followed our desires, our momentary desires. We have convinced ourselves that our desires need to be gratiated, need to be satisfied, need, need to be uh, yielded to. And we are paying a price to this day. And maybe we're even a little bit angry at ourselves, and maybe we're a little bit angry at God and angry at life, and we feel like we've been cheated or something. But if you really assess it and analyze it, it's because I listened to my desires. They were not divinely inspired. They were not divinely motivated. They were mine, and things did not end well. And here I am. But you're here now, and the loving God is saying, Are you willing? Are you just willing to let me inspire something new in you? Are you willing to do it differently? Are you willing to try it my way instead of insisting on doing it your way? 
In the book of Deuteronomy, one of my favorite verses, this was a pivotal verse in my life about my second year of being a follower of Christ. I had the boldness, I've shared this before, to ask God and say, God, I know you want us to obey you, but why do you want us to obey you? I actually asked God this. I was a little bit scared. <laughs> I was only a follower of Christ for two years. And God led me to this verse. And I'm telling you, it opened the word of God and the heart of God to me in a way that, that nothing else probably has. It, it was a transforming experience that set off the rest of my walk with God. So here's the verse, Deuteronomy 5, 29. This, this is God sharing his heart, kind of pouring his feelings out vulnerably. He says, oh, oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me. That word fear, it doesn't mean like be scared of me. It means to supremely regard me, to have reverence for me, to realize I'm their best hope. Nobody loves them like I love them. Oh, that they had such hearts that would be inclined to fear me and do what? What is it? Get it out. Come on, get it out. Get it out. Keep on my command. What? That sounds oppressive and restrictive. Or is it? God inviting us to experience happiness at the highest level. Yes, it is. It's him knowing what we need and knowing what is best and wanting what is best. Oh, he says, man, I just wish their attitude, I wish their feelings, I, I, wish, I wish they trusted me enough that they would, they would keep all my commands. That's comprehensive. All. We can trust all his commands. And how often should we keep his commands? What is the word? Always. Always. Why? Why? And this is where the lights went on. So that it might what? Oh, my goodness. When I read that verse after following Jesus for two years, it, it was explosively illuminating. I knew then God did understand me. He did want my highest happiness and well-being. The difference was he actually knew what would bring it since he created me, and I did not. I was an experimenter. I was a fool. I tried some things, and some things were good, and some things brought a lot of consequences. But God wants me to obey him because he knows what's best, and he wants what's best. And so these desires, if you have in your heart now a desire that, man, all I want to do the rest of my life is I want to know God's will as it's deposited in his word, and I want to do God's will. I'm telling you, flan, fan the flame of that desire. That's a holy desire. That will energize you. That will motivate you, and that will enable you to walk onto the path of not just knowing God's will, and that has to be the starting place. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. I first have to know God's will as it's revealed in his word before I will be able to do God's will. But it's as I'm doing God's will, that's where dynamic things start to happen. So last week I, I shared with you a kind of a divinely ordained uh, learning cycle, and, and we can't get around this cycle. God put it into place, and it goes kind of like this. The divinely ordained learning cycle I start with incompetence but willingness. That's desire, divinely inspired desire. So I start out, I'm not gentle. I'm not compassionate. I'm not all those things that we read on that list in those verses in Colossians. But I want to be. I want to be like God. I'm not like God. I don't love like God loves. I don't live like God lives, but I want to. I've seen something that I know is right. If everyone lived like God showed himself to be in Jesus, I know that that's the way life should be. He really is the way. He really is the truth. He really is the life. And I want it. So I go from incompetence. I don't have it. I'm not righteous. I'm not loving. I'm not compassionate yet. But I want it. I'm willing. Divinely inspired desires. From there, submission to direction. I go to the Word of God. I submit to its teaching. I internalize its teaching. And then improvement of focused practice. I start taking steps to Put the Word of God into action, and then competence finally achieved. A process. Now, I'm going to unpack this a little better as we go on in this message, but this is kind of an early introduction to this key of cultivating, cultivating certain things that just need certain things, certain actions that will bring us God's kind of happiness, an improved level of happiness. They won't happen unless you and I are willing to cultivate those traits that we read early on in Colossians 3. So let me go on to the second part of this. The cruciality of divinely inspired actions. This is really where I was trying to bring you to. So the desires have to be there. If you don't desire to be like Christ, if you don't desire to be holy, to be righteous, to love like God loves and live like God lives, well then, 
there's nothing really for you in the rest of this message. And you will have to stumble your way through life getting the imperfect little bites of happiness that you can. But if we're willing to be teachable to God, the cruciality of divinely specified actions, this will take us into a different direction and will elevate our happiness. Now, I, I put together some things that I've learned through life. I don't know if these are original or not. I don't know if I've ever had original thought in my life. But, but, but I'm just going to share these little things with you. And they all have one thing in common. They are action-oriented discoveries. Randyisms. Keep it moving or it will stop moving. I have learned this the hard way the older I get. Apathy brings atrophy. Uh, com capacities we have don't develop, don't expand unless they're activated. Stress builds strength. Some of you hate to even read that, but it's true. Push beyond or you'll fall behind. That is also true. If you stand still, you'll sink. You'll start to drown. You've got you to keep moving forward. You're like an airplane. This life is like an airplane journey. Move forward faster, higher, or we go down quickly. Consistency, consi this is a big secret most people don't like, expands capacity. What I do again and again with the eye focused to improvement, I will suddenly have capacities to do things that I could not do before. Consistency brings capacity, and then this is a big one. Do what you, what is the word? Can't. Do what you can't. How long? Until you can. Sounds contradictory, but it is true. God tells us to do certain things, like we read on that list, be kind, compassionate, gentle, humble, forbearing, forgiving. Initially, if we were honest, we might say, man, I can't do that. That's just not me. But I'm going to do it, God, because you tell me to do it. Therefore, you must know I have the capacity to do it. You made me in your own image. So I'm going to do what I can't, but I'm going to do it until I can. And I'm confident I can because you wouldn't tell me to do something that you wouldn't ultimately enable me to do. Psalm 34 just kind of gives it in a real simple form. It says, turn from evil and do good. Could anything be more simple and clear than that? So all I have to do is start assessing whatever is evil in my life, eliminate it, avoid it, put it out of my life. Then I start having to assess what is good, and I'm going to do that. Action brings transformation. Tell you a story. Uh, uh, two guys, two buddies, decided uh, they were tired of being out of shape, and they were interesting guys. They were both 25 years old, 185 pounds, six foot tall, almost identical, almost identical. So they start going to the gym, and they say, "Okay, man, we're going to learn. We're going to start eating differently. We're going to get into a serious uh, exercise, you know, regimen." And they they work with each other. They're doing the same routines. They're eating the same diet. They're getting the same amount of sleep. But something weird is happening. One guy every year. Man, he's getting big. He's getting all buffed up and, you know, ripping out of his clothes. And, and the buddy is like, what are you, are we still doing the same diet? Yeah, we're still. And so this goes on for three years. Where after three years, the one guy, he's in shape, he's lean, he's hard. But the other guy is a monster. He's, he's grown exponentially. I mean, he's way, way bigger three years later. So his buddy says to him, he says, man, can we sit down and compare notes again? I don't get this. How come you're looking like that? And I'm, you know, I'm in shape, but I'm not like you. You're just growing so huge and so big. I mean, so, okay, you're eating this, I'm eating that. You're doing that routine, I'm doing that routine. You're getting this much sleep, I'm getting this much sleep. Is there anything, is there anything that you're not telling me? Is there, is there something I'm missing in this, in this thing? And the friend says, well, I don't know, man. I mean, we're doing the same stuff. We've known each other our lives. The only, only thing I can figure is maybe it's the steroids. I don't know. <laughs> There's a spiritual steroid that I'm going to introduce to you, and it's going to be so obvious that some of you, you're already utilizing it. But for others of you that maybe are followers of Christ, but you're kind of stuck. You, you know what we tell people? people? People put their faith in Christ, and then they want to grow. They want to become more like Christ, which is what every Christian really wants to be. And we say, okay, man, here, here's what you do. Here's what you do. You got to go to church every Sunday. Uh, get yourself in a small group. That, that'll really help you some. Buy a study Bible. Study your Bible. Learn how to pray. Share your life with God. Pray through the day and all that kind of thing. Uh, learn, learn to serve. You know, learn to give. And so we give them all this stuff, and they're like, okay. Okay, and sure enough, if you do all those things, you, you will grow some. You will grow some, but you will hit a ceiling pretty quickly. 
because unless you on your own do something else that I'm going to introduce to you very specifically your, your growth will hit a ceiling you won't grow you'll be wanting to be compassionate you'll be wanting to be gentle you'll be wanting to be forgiving but you, you won't be able to do it and you'll be frustrated and angry at yourself and you'll just keep hitting this ceiling unless you are aware of this spiritual steroid <laughs> And some of you, you've already been practicing. You're going to say, oh, Randy, I did that from the beginning. Well, that's cool. I'm glad. I'm happy for you. You're experiencing Christ-like growth and transformation. But some of you are not. And this simplistic concept can catalyze new spiritual growth in your life that will end in you being happier so that it's very worth all, all the effort involved. All right, here we go. He himself, talking about Jesus, bore our sins in his own body on the cross why so that that's telling us why why did he bear my sins on the cross why did he bear my sins on the cross to pay the penalty for my sins so I don't have to spend eternity in hell that's not what it says and you by the way you won't find that anywhere in the entire Bible but what it does say he bore our sins in his own body on the cross so that that's why so that we might you tell me what does it say Die to sins, huh? And do what? Oh wow. Wow, wait, wait a minute now. So so that so that's saying that his sacrificial death for me on the cross, he didn't sin, it was my sin, it was the sin of the world that put him up there. He was innocent. So he's saying that by, by him refusing to use his almighty power to save himself from the cross, by by bearing my sin on the cross, it was meant to motivate me. It was meant to illuminate me. It was meant to energize me to die to sin, to change my view of what God calls sin. And sin is just that which God says is discordant with my nature. It's never going to bring happiness ultimately. It might bring self-gratification immediately, but it always ends with consequence. He says, I was to be motivated. I was to be changed in my view so that sin now I look at as poison. I don't want any part of it. But on the other hand, righteousness I look at as something I desire. It's the key to happiness. It's the key to life. It's the way I was meant to live. The sacrificial death of Christ on the cross was meant to so win my trust, my admiration, my affection, that I was going to change the way I think about sin and change the way I think about righteousness. It was meant to motivate me, energize me, inspire me to change the way I live. And there's a specificity to this whole thing. And the book of Colossians, where we started it, talk, it talked about it. If you recall, when we started Colossians 3.16, it said, put on or clothe yourselves with these things and then he gave that list and we'll look at this again in a minute you know and he gave you know compassion and kindness and tenderness and all those things the book of Ephesians says the same thing in a slightly different way you were taught with regard to your former way of life to do what put off your old self well what does that mean what is your old self? Well, it, well, it's the composite of who I was before I put my trust in Christ and became his follower. It was all my thoughts. It was all my value systems. It was my reaction patterns. It was my coping mechanisms. It was my desires, my pursuits. It, it was everything I did and thought and believed in and pursued. It's just, just who I was, my old habits. I'm supposed to put off all of that, all of who I was. Not my core identity, so to speak, but the habits and morals and so forth put off your old self now I have to I have to become aware of the patterns of my old self in order to put it off but put it off that's calling for action that's where I'm trying to get to all those randyisms they all have one thing in common they were activistic unless we take certain action certain desired results won't occur put off your old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires notice a desire driven life apart from those desires being inspired by God will lead us to uh, disappointment and I'm to put on the what? The new self. What is that? The new self created to be like who? God in true what? And what else? That is saying that if you become who God from eternity past always intended you to become, if I become who God always intended me to become, 
I will be a being that lives like God lives and loves like God loves. To be created to be like God. You were created to be like God. The only way life in the universe can exist in harmony and peace and joy and, and eternal happiness is if everybody conducts themselves the way that God conducts himself. He's not asking us ever to do something that he himself does not do. He simply wants us all to enjoy the happiness individually and corporately that occurs when we pursue true righteousness and true holiness. Holiness is not foreign. Holiness brings happiness, true, perfect, lasting happiness. So the key, the catalyst, the, the reason that some of you have been stuck in your growth and some of you are just pursuing this path that what will keep your growth going is you have to hear how activistic this is. It is calling for a determined set of actions of our will. It means that I'm going to observe my life now differently. And whenever I see that old self, that old Randy popping up, I'm going to condemn it. I'm saying, no way. I'm, I'm not going. I'm not going to behave that way anymore. I'm not going to respond that way anymore. I'm not going to react that way anymore. That's the old self. And I'm going to conscientiously put on the new self. I'm going to put on, remember we read at the beginning, put on kindness and gentleness and patience and, and uh, compassion. Now, the question becomes, how do you put those things on? I mean, I know how to put my clothes on. But how do you put on compassion? How do you put on gentleness? Let, let me show you that list again, if I can just get that up. How, how do you put, this was all in that Colossians 3 passage we read. How do you put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forbearing, forgiving? How do, because God is advocating, he's saying, unless, you've got to hear this, Christians, unless we consciously exercise our will and put on, go back and read Colossians on your own. It is calling for us to take action and put on. I hate this kind of quasi-theology people say oh man you just kind of let go and let God you just you just surrender yourself to God a living sacrifice and everything is transformed no it's not no I, I, I'm to be a living sacrifice to God every day meaning that I'm yielding my will I'm yielding to do his will but I have to use my will to do his will God wants my will to be strengthened by his spirit Put on, we read. Put off, we read. Now, how do I put on these traits, though? I mean, do I just pray them on? Oh, Lord, help me this day to be compassionate. That's a good idea. Praying for them is a good idea, but it won't be enough. It won't be enough. It's a critical step. Some of you think, Randy, you're, you're making this big. You're building tension, and we already know this. Forgive me, you that already know this. There's probably some that don't know this. How do I put on compassion? All right, here it is. Here's the steroid spiritual steroid I start doing the compassionate things before I feel compassion I pray I ask God for wisdom Lord what would be the compassionate thing to do in this situation and I do it and I do it over and over and over Lord what would be the kind response in this situation and I do it and I do it when I feel like it and I do it when I don't feel like it Lord, what would, what would be the patient response to this? Even though I don't really feel very patient, I feel irritated right now. I'm going to do the patient thing. I'm going to put off the old self. The old self would have been impatient. New self, patient. So I consciously do the patient thing, the gentle thing, the humble thing, the forgiving thing, the forbearing thing. I do them before I am them. I do them maybe before I feel them until I become them you see here's the secret it is in the doing that we develop it is in, you cannot get away from this step it would be like me trying to learn to play the keyboard studying all about music you know studying the history of keyboards but never really trying to do what's impossible for me to do play the keyboard I have to be willing to do or attempt to do what is impossible until I can actually do it so this step, some of you have been missing this activistic step and you're butting your head against the ceiling unnecessarily and you're minimizing your happiness that God wants to give you. You've got to start doing the things that God says we can do before you actually can do them. I know that sounds crazy, but you know what I'm saying. All right, let me share, let me wind it up with this. Mini divine development cycle starts with divinely inspired desires. I've got to want it. I've got to want to be like Jesus 
And then decisiveness. I'm now actually going to pursue. It's going to be my, my number one pursuit in life to, to become the human being, the Christ-like version of myself. Determination. I'm going to put it into practice. I'm going to do the kind thing before I feel kind. I'm going to do the gentle thing. I'm going to forgive before I feel like forgiving. And I'm going to continue to do these things until I become them. Some of you, you've walked with God long enough. You know the cycle. And you're like, man, I started out, I was uncaring as could be I was not compassionate at all but years came and years went and you kept doing the compassionate things and all of a sudden you're so tender-hearted now that it's remarkable you are not the same person you are a Christ-like version of yourself because you did what God said to do and that catalyzes those dormant capacities within us and they start to grow exponentially and then what we once could not do we do with ease but if you don't activate your will and put off your old self to put on the new and put on compassion and kindness and gentleness and humbleness you will not develop the way God wants each of us to develop and you will be depriving yourself unnecessarily of being happier because these Christ-like traits Man, they absolutely make us happier people. Decisiveness, determination, and it finally brings development. So here's a closing thought. How about instead of this one, <laughs> how about this one? Godly people bless. And it's true. When you're godly, meaning you're becoming, you're learning to live like God lives and love the way he loves, you're going to find happiness growing inside of you. More important, you're going to be a carrier of God and a carrier of happiness to every person you interact with. You're, going, you're not just going to be blessed. You're going to be a blessing. People are going to be glad they talked to you, glad they met you, glad you got involved in their life. And that will also exponentially raise your happiness. Being a blessing is one of the greatest elevators of happiness that we can experience in this life. So, as we close out, I'm going to take us back where we were before. If you've not made your decision to put your trust in Christ and become His follower, oh man, you're never going to have a better day than today to do that. God loves you. He's for you. But His hands are tied until we put our faith, our trust in Him and are willing to be His follower. And at that point, He forgives all of our sins and gives us everlasting life. And man, he can start to really show us the path to happiness. For some of the rest of us, have you, have you activated the spiritual steroid of putting on, putting off? It'll transform your life. You've got to stick with it. It takes humility and it takes patience. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these, these simplistic, beautiful insights, uh, patterns, processes that you've you divinely ordained for our growth and our development. Thank you that we, we get to cooperate with you and we get to see with our own eyes of experience the happiness increase that your ways, your will, your righteousness, your love actually bring to us. Father, don't let anybody leave here today without taking these truths into their hearts, into their minds, and wrestling with them in the way that will be beneficial for them. I ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.